but lovely to see you all. And I'm just here to introduce the concept of homeless and inclusion health before my colleagues come and tell you about their roles within it. But first of all, just to you know, profile, this is us, the London Network of Nurses and Midwives Homelessness Group. That photo was taken at one of our conferences in 2018. Um, we're very open to students. Please come and join us. Um, if you've got a chance during this event, please do tweet. Uh, tweet at us, but tell the world as well. Leave comments on Facebook. And if you've got any questions afterwards, then do feel free to email us. We're very friendly and don't bite. So what is inclusion health? Um, this is quite a sort of a complicated definition, but it's a research service and policy agenda that aims to redress the most extreme health inequalities amongst our most vulnerable and marginalised people in society. So it's basically a social justice agenda, um, but it is also a clinical discipline. So akin to palliative care or cardiology, um, people do need specialist clinical skills in order to be able to redress those health inequalities. And thinking about people that come under the umbrella of inclusion health, we've got about 320,000 homeless people, um, both rough sleepers and also people living in hostels and in temporary accommodation, and that includes 120,000 children. It's estimated that there's 300,000 hidden homeless people, people who are sofa surfing or living on buses or living at work or living on boats. We've got 84,000 prisoners, around 195,000 asylum seekers and refugees currently. 11,000 trafficked people, over a million people who are undocumented, um, in without registering or people who have overstayed their visas. We've got about 500,000 Gypsy Roma traveller and 73,000 sex workers. And there is some crossover uh, across these groups, but not loads. So this is over 2 million people. And we know that about 25% of those are experiencing severe and multiple disadvantage. But they're not the only people experiencing health inequalities, as I'm sure you know, and you might think of people with learning disabilities or severe mental health problems. And indeed, lots of people in poverty experience health inequalities. Um, and prior to the pandemic, Joseph Roundtree estimated that around 20% of people are living in poverty. And I'm sure some of you will have heard in your courses about the recent update to the Michael Marmot report 10 years on, which has shown that, you know, the difference in health between the haves and the have nots has worsened over the last 10 years. And an example of this is life expectancy across two areas, the richest and the poorest in Glasgow, a difference of 14 years, which is pretty shocking. But it's important to note that it's not just about poverty. And if you think about those inclusion health groups, they have worst, the worst outcomes. So this is the only complicated graph you're gonna get. IMD means indices of multiple deprivation. And what this graph is showing you, and you probably won't be surprised to hear this, is that as you move from the least deprived area to the most deprived area, your chances of having asthma, COPD, epilepsy, or whatever goes up. But in this case, what you're seeing, that red bar is people experiencing homelessness. And what this is showing you is that if you're currently homeless, then you're far, far more likely to have any of these things than even if you live in one of the most deprived areas in the UK. And it's not just the likelihood of having those things, you're likely to have much more likely to have more than one condition if you're in an inclusion health group. And again, with the example of homelessness, um, this is often called trimorbidity, tri and you're far more likely to have mental health problems, substance misuse problems, and physical health care problems, often lots of physical health care problems together at the same time. And this is a problem because healthcare services aren't set up in that way. They're not set up to, uh, to deal with multiple conditions at the same time. So you have to go to mental health for your mental health problem, substance misuse for your substance misuse problem. So that obviously creates issues. And I'm afraid to say that the end results of that, and again, we'll stay with homelessness here, are that the mortality statistics are dreadful. 
So this is a study by the Office of National Statistics that's been looking at the death certificates of people experiencing homelessness since 2013. So this is obviously people at the sharp end of homelessness because homelessness has been mentioned on the death certificate. But nevertheless, this is quite shocking. In 2019, the average age of death for those people experiencing homelessness was 46 for men and 43 for women. And the last time that that was true in the general population is in around 1840. And outcomes for other inclusion health groups are similarly pretty dire. So this piece of work is generally respected um, and says that Gypsy Roma Traveller have a life expectancy 10 to 12 years less than the non-traveller population. But there are other pieces of work that estimate that it's much more like 25 to 30 years. And as Chris mentioned, one of the key problems here for all inclusion health groups is barrier to access to health services both primary care, that's GP services and community nursing, and also to secondary care hospitals. And all of these barriers exist. Lack of an, uh, an address or an email address, literacy. So for example, 15% of the UK population have a literacy level below eight. Language, memory problems, neurodiversity. So for example, it's estimated that around 12% of the homeless population uh, have autistic traits. Mental health. Obviously poverty, for example, having no credit on your phone or no money for travel. Difficulty accessing systems and COVID um, has led to the demise of drop-in services and that's become, made booking appointments much more difficult for some people. And that's through to hospital booking systems, which are incredibly complicated and obviously impossible if you don't have digital access. There are behavioural issues which can relate back to psychological trauma, which means that people have difficulty trusting and building relationships with new services. And lots of practical challenges like simply, and I've put one here, like who will look after my dog or, or, or my children or, you know, enable me if I'm on my own. And finally, addictions and related with withdrawal can mean that it, people find it quite difficult to wait. And that's just the barriers at an individual level because we know that there are lots of system level barriers as well. Patients are stigmatised and I've lost count now of the amount of people that have told me rather shockingly that they've been sprayed with air freshener when they've come into A&E when they're homeless. As I said, there's a medical reductionist model. People are managed in silos. People are turned away from GP registration. You do not need any form of ID, photo ID, address ID, proof of your immigration status to register with a GP in the UK but unfortunately people are asked about this repeatedly and we can come back to this later if you're interested. NHS charging reg regulations apply to people with no status in the UK and as we said there are lots of those um, but anybody without ID may be being put off accessing care in the UK for fear of being charged and chances to miss every contact count are missed. And what we might mean by this in this context is somebody comes with what their priority is now, which might be a hurt finger, but that chance to think about their mental health, their addiction, maybe their hep C is missed um, and, and unfortunately is gone. So one answer to all of these problems uh, or part of the answer, specialist services and roles. And some of the people that are gonna to talk to you today are up on the screen, but um, you know, you're gonna hear lots of really inspiring things from my senior colleagues who are gonna be on the call today. And so if you're interested in finding out more after you've heard from people at the end, I'm gonna put some of these links up in the chat. Um, I'd recommend going to the government website, Inclusion Health, Applying All of Our Health, um, and that will give you lots of ideas as to where to find out more. And also the Starting Out and Homeless in Inclusion Health Nursing document on the Q&I website. Again, I'll put both of those links up and also you can have this presentation afterwards and the slide just goes straight through to those documents. You might want to think about getting involved in campaigning or volunteering. So MEDACT, brings healthcare professionals together to campaign on a wide variety of issues um, and particularly recently NHS charging and the Patients Not Passports campaign and you might want to, um, to think about getting involved in a local campaigning group. The Museum of Homelessness campaigns to raise the profile of those homeless deaths that I was just talking about 
And Doctors of the World is currently hiring student nurse or student doctor, you know, volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering, get in touch with them. Do join these networks, both our network, but also the QI Homeless Health Network and the Faculty of Homeless and Inclusion Health. They're free to join um, and you'll get you know, information about CPD, about cheap conferences, about events that you can join. Think about asking to visit and shadow um, local services, for example, local day centres, support centres, night shelters, advice centres. I know it's really difficult during COVID, but as I've put there, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Um, and people will try and help. And just to say, I'm going to put a survey in the chat as well. The Q&I has partnered with Health Education England. And what they're trying to do is understand what more is needed in terms of community placements. It only needs two or three minutes. So do, do, do have a look at it um, and respond. So this is me nearly over now. If I were you, I'd be asking this question and, and, and that would be this, should inclusion health actually be a specialist discipline or should inclusion healthcare be something that all healthcare practitioners deliver in all settings? And my answer to that is obviously it should be something that's delivered by all healthcare practitioners in all health settings and that everybody should be taught inclusive practice. But in the current state of the healthcare system, we do need specialists. Um, so this, if this is an area that interests you, um, you know, stay with us um, and, you know, we would be very happy to welcome you into the, into the club. <laughs> I just wanted to finish with this quote from Michael Marmot. It looks complicated, um, as does the proportionate universalism thing, but what it basically means is we need to do more for those that have less. And that is what this agenda is about. Uh, just a final thing from me, um, so we're involved with MEDACT, um, I'm going to put this petition also in the chat, um, this is about adequate housing for homeless families because homeless families have fared terribly during the pandemic. So that's it from me for the moment, I hope you enjoy um, the presentations and I will be back later for the chat.